So we've been studying the promises of God. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit as we continue on John chapter 14 through 16. It tells us much about that. This is the convincer slash convictor, the Holy Spirit. John 16 verses 15 through 25. I want to give you a word first, um, a bit of testimony with keeping in mind the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is in my life. When I was 19 years old, I trusted Christ in a second story karate studio above the main street in Carbondale, Illinois. I was invited by a friend to go to a Bible study there. And there was a moment when a guy presented the gospel to me and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but salvation was a process. I didn't feel any different. I had a calm assurance, a quiet joy that seemed to grow. Before that time, I was in a search. I was in turmoil. It was a long, long search. I kept looking for something. My heart was discontent. I was 17 years old, and I was in x-ray school, radiologic technology school. When I started, I was a functional alcoholic like my dad and like my brother. And I lived with my oldest brother and his family. And he and I would go out to the bars on uh, frequently. Sometimes I chose to go out and drink on my own. It made me feel, you know, I didn't like the taste that much, but it made me feel happy, important, part of the group. Until the morning after, and the feelings were a little different. Headache. So, no fulfillment in it, though. No peace. I often went out looking for ladies, um, but those proved to be empty relationships. I did get involved in some drugs, smoked weed and experimented with some other drugs and no enlightenment there. I remember one experience that I had when I was very high and I was trying to read the Bible and you're like, where did that come from? And, uh, and it so happened that a friend of mine, uh, one of my partying buddies, told us uh, when we were out one night about the horrors of Revelation. So I said, hmm, you know, I'm not sure that I trust this guy completely. I want to read this for myself. So I got out our, our family Bible. It's really high, and I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> but I, I did feel kind of this evil presence with me, kind of a demonic presence, possibly. I cried out to God for help. And a few months later, he sent help in the form of a guy who came into a bar to invite me to come to Carbondale to look, uh, look with him at a house, considering going off campus and living together. Then I was invited to that Bible study I mentioned to you. The Holy Spirit was at work on my heart for some time before I believed. I remember lift, listening to a number of songs, secular songs, and uh, one in particular seemed to have kind of a spiritual message. I was touched by it. It was kind of a searcher song. You know, there's a few searcher songs out there in secular music, like maybe Dust in the Wind. Have you heard that? There's real truth there. Not many answers, but, but real truth. And this is a similar song to that. As I was convinced, or I'm sorry, after I was converted a few weeks later, I heard this song again with new ears. The, the band is Little River Band, 1975. That's going to date me a bit. It's a long way there. Let me read just a few of the lyrics to you. People on their own are going nowhere. I'm on the road to see. If anything is anywhere waiting just for me. Every night I walk around the city, seems like I'll never know. The feeling of being together when I go. 
And it's a long way there. It's a long way to where I'm going. But I feel like I've been here for the whole of my life, never knowing home. Never knowing home. That last line that struck me like a ton of bricks because as a new believer, the search was over. I knew where home was. We sang that in the first song that we sang here. I know I have a home. It's not far. My search was done. It was solid. My relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, spoke to my heart. He declared it to me. That Those words are in our passage twice. You'll see it. He declared it to me, to my heart, through a secular song. Imagine that. Turn with me, John chapter 16. We're going to read through verse 5 through 15. John chapter 16. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. I said, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus has been telling his disciples gently for the last two chapters that he's going away. In John 14.3 and also 14.15, he's said it. Now he says he's going back to the Father. It's where he came from. And what's their response, verse 6, to this? How do they respond? Sorrow filled their hearts, right? Why do you think they're sad? They're focused on their their loss, right? They've been with Jesus and he's going to be gone. They loved hanging out with Jesus. They hoped to set up an earthly kingdom, but it's clear that's not going to happen, right? That was disappointing. And Jesus gently rebukes them. He says, no one asks. No one asks him, where are you going? You know, before they asked, Peter and Thomas both asked him about that. But not this time. Their focus... They're all lost. They're self-centered. There's no joy thinking of Jesus, right? He's the suffering servant. He's come. He's given a lot to come down to them. He said he's from God. He's going to go back to glory. And they're like bummed out. Couldn't you like have a little empathy for Jesus here? That's his place. That's his home. It's our home too. To get home, he knows he must go through the cross. He must be tortured and beaten and spit upon and stripped and humiliated and crucified so that he can redeem a people to himself. 
He will reconcile hostile enemy hearts to himself. He will fulfill his father's plan and provide perfect righteousness to the wicked who have none of their own. He will be raised from the dead. He will have God's seal of approval on his perfect work. He will spend time with His disciples and ascend into heaven to take His place at God's right hand. And all this happens according to God's sovereign plan in agreement with His will. If Jesus had not fulfilled all, if He had not done it perfectly, would He be allowed to sit at God's right hand? It wouldn't happen. Not with a God who's of pure eyes than to behold evil. He can't overlook any wickedness. But the disciples are so selfish, they don't ask, where are you going? They've seen the example of Jesus who is the man of sorrows. And he gets outside of himself. He constantly serving others with a happy heart. Yet they sit in sorrow. Woe is me. Woe, woe is me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go. If I don't go away, the Helper will not come to you. Wait a minute. Jesus said it's to our advantage? How can that be? He's the Son of God. He loves us. He teaches us. He protects us. I mean, He calmed the wind and the waves. How could it be to our advantage to lose Him? Jesus has already told them a number of times things about the Holy Spirit, like John 14, 16, He's to be with you forever. Verse 26, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Okay, we're listening now. I don't see how this can be better, but fire away. Verse 8, And when He comes, that's the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Spirit's to be at work in the world. That could be helpful. I mean, Jesus, if we look back at the beginning of chapter 16, in verse 2, He tells them about their opposition. And what kinds of things are they going to suffer at the opposition as they go out? What's going to happen to them? Put out of the synagogues and and killed. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Then they'll say it. It's because we're serving God. We did this. I mean, that's that's what Paul did, right? Saul. What kind of guy was he towards Christians? He was a persecutor, and he imprisoned Christians, right? And what happened to Stephen? Stoned to death. Paul was right there participating. It would be good to have God's help, invisible help against those guys, the opposition. The Spirit will convict. What does that mean? The word convict means, or It can mean to convict or convince. Convict is to prove guilty. Convince to persuade a person to believe. Both apply. In Romans, the gospel proves that the whole world is guilty before God. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. As they would read Paul's words, if they take that to heart, whole world guilty before God. Paul, speaking of the gospel, says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. 2 Corinthians 5.11, that's to convince. Spirit is at work in both, convincing and convicting. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to expose men's sin and present the truth about Jesus Christ. When sin is exposed, they have a choice to repent turn from their sin, or to continue in it. Then they have a choice regarding Jesus. The Spirit reveals Jesus as the Savior from sin. It's their choice to trust Him or reject Him. 
the result, new life in Christ or hardening of the heart and eternal punishment. So there's a three-part conviction by the Holy Spirit. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's look at each one of those. Verse 9, concerning sin, because they do not believe me, the ultimate sin is what? To do what? To reject Christ, God's Son. Consider God's perspective for a moment. He sent His Son, His only Son, to die in our place, to remove our sin, bring us into fellowship with Him forever. To accept this incredible offer, you must love Jesus and accept what He has done for you and turn from your sin. If you refuse or make no choice, you reject His beloved Son. Can you understand how that that's the greatest sin of all? In fact, if we look at every sin, we find in every sin the root, the root of unbelief. My worry, my cheating, my lust, I ultimately don't trust God with what He's given me. I want more. I will have it. Verse 10, righteousness. This is the other side of the coin of sin. When we start to see our sin as God sees it, we understand our depravity. That's the depth of our own sin and the perfection of Jesus' righteousness. MacArthur says this, not only does the Spirit convict unbelievers of their sin, but also of the necessity of having the perfect righteousness of Christ. Matthew 5, 48. When their wickedness is compared to His sinless holiness, their sin is seen more truly for the detestable evil that it is. And the sinner is face to face with the impossibility of salvation by any effort, work, or achievement he may do. There's nothing we can do of our effort, work, or achievement to bring us salvation. The Lord's statement, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, provides the supreme evidence of His righteousness, His acceptance into the Father's presence. When the Father highly exalted Him, Jesus, and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, Philippians 2.9, He Himself testified to Christ's righteousness. Those who hate heed the Spirit's testimony about their utter sinfulness and Christ's perfect righteousness, those who respond to the gospel in genuine faith are instantly clothed in righteousness. White robes. Their sins are placed fully on Him and His death at the hands of God's holy justice. He paid the penalty in full. He paid it all. Hendrickson says this, verse 10, because I go to the Father, this is Jesus, and you see me no longer, the world represented at that time by the Jews was about to crucify Jesus. It was going to say, he ought to die, John 19, 7. Hence, in the name of righteousness, it was going to put him to death. It proclaimed aloud that he was anything but righteous. It treated him as a wicked man, John 18.30, but the exact opposite was the truth. Though rejected by the world, he was welcomed by the Father, welcomed home by way of the cross, the cross which led to the crown. He was about to die, and he was about to receive his reward. Philippians 2.9-11, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the Righteous One. John eight forty six. Verse 11. The Holy Spirit convicts, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan is the ruler of this world, and he is defeated. Jesus destroyed his work by his death and resurrection. Satan came to blind men to the truth, and he came to take them to hell 
and eternal sufferings. He came to get men so bound to their sin that they could never get loose, that they would sink down to hell, unable to extract themselves. But Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, to forgive sin and free men from its chains. He brings life and resurrects men out of spiritual death, translating them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He promises them a home in heaven with him forever. They are no longer sentenced to spend eternity in hell if they trust him by faith. On the last day, the devil that deceived the world is cast into the lake of fire and sulfur to be tormented forever and ever, Revelation 20.10. And by that act, God makes clear it's not only Satan, but a few verses later, it's the great white throne and men stand before him to be judged by their own works. Those who have trusted in Jesus Christ don't stand in that judgment. Those who are standing on their own works are there and they will be judged and thrown in the lake of fire as well. Anyone uh, around you that might intimidate you, some wicked person who seems bigger than life here and who seems so on top of things and able to do whatever they want, every person will be judged and God's justice will be done. Their doom is sure, just as Satan's doom is sure. Revelation 20. Peter uses three elements. When we look and we've seen Jesus speaking of the Spirit here, and He breathes out the Spirit at the end of John, and we see the Spirit come in tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2. And then we see Peter's first sermon, Acts 2. And the elements of his sermon are these three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Acts 2, the, the sin of rejecting Christ. You, by the hand of lawless men, crucified and killed Him, Jesus. This Jesus whom you crucified. Righteousness. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God. And judgment. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Evil men. Verse 40, the result of this preaching, the Holy Spirit, that's Acts 2, 40. The result of this preaching, the Holy Spirit powerfully used this preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, brothers, what shall we do? They repented and were baptized, and there were added to them that day 3,000 souls. No one can be saved outside the convicting and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus was patient with His disciples and kind. He didn't rebuke them, but gently leads them. He gives them milk instead of meat. Why couldn't they bear this truth? Well, we already said in part that they were in great sorrow. That was a part of it. But there's more to it. A very important factor, they simply couldn't handle the truth he had for them. The word bear does not mean endure or tolerate. The word has the idea of weight, sheer weight. It was too heavy for them. There's a famous Christian lady who was a, in a Nazi concentration camp in the Second World War. You may know her name as Corey Tinboom. Her father was a watchmaker, and, when, and he had a, a bag with his tools. And one day, as a very young girl, she was reading the newspaper. She asked her dad, what, what is a sex crime? And he asked her to pick up his tool bag and bring it to him. And she tried, and she said, I can't do it. It's too heavy. Her father said, the explanation of this sex crime is too heavy for you to carry just yet. These truths were too weighty for the disciples. 
the significance of the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension, before those things even took place, they could not get it. They could not handle it. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. MacArthur says the disciples viewed Jesus as a political and military deliverer. They expected him to drive out the hated Romans, restore Israel's national sovereignty, and bring in the Messianic kingdom with the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. They simply could not grasp the concept of a dying Messiah who came not to vanquish the Romans, but to conquer sin and death. For example, Jesus prophesied about his own death, Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through 34. You can't get more specific from this. I just read the Gospels. I'm like, you know, Jesus kind of spells it out here, doesn't he? That's what he's going to do here. Verse 12, uh, I'm sorry, he takes the 12 and he said to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he, Jesus, will be delivered over to the Gentiles and be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. You got it in a nutshell, right? You, you've seen it. You know what's going to happen, right? You've been told the whole story. Did they get it? No, they didn't get it. It says this, verse 34, but they understood none of these things. The meaning was hidden from them. The Spirit has to reveal this spiritual truth. Jesus also did not give the disciples further revelation because uh, they didn't have the Spirit's indwelling. They lacked the power to grasp it. Verse 13, He's the Spirit of truth. He's all about Jesus. Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. He does not speak of Himself. His focus is on Jesus Christ. He doesn't drive. He leads. He leads into all truth. Isn't that encouraging for us? As we would go through life and we have perplexities and difficulties and things, you've got a book, a book that God has given you. And there's truth. And you have a spirit that will lead you into all truth. It's a tremendous promise, isn't it? He doesn't skip the parts you don't like either, does he? He'll shoot straight with you even when it's painful and awkward. The Father and the Spirit, they're one in essence. He hears, He will speak, verse 13. And it says, verse 15, and all that the Father has is mine. They're one, just as Jesus and the Father are one. The Spirit will never violate the principles of God's Word. He is a prophetic Spirit. He inspired John to write Revelation and the other books of Old Testament prophecy. He will declare, verse 13, He will declare to you the things that are to come. Verse 14, He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and He will declare it to you. The ultimate purpose of the Spirit's revelation is to glorify Jesus. He doesn't speak of Himself, just as Jesus glorified the Father. Is glory important? Seems to be a recurring theme, don't you think? Like throughout the whole Bible, glory's all over it. And that's why we have that little saying that we put out so much, what's the chief end of man? What's the most important thing man could do? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Well, the, the, the Trinity's no different. They're all over glory, aren't they? They glorify one another. He doesn't speak of Himself, just as Jesus glorified the Father. Notice the Spirit speaks, and it's a declaration. It's not a wimpy whisper or a hesitating whine. He declares it. Just like Peter was declaring in Acts 2, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst, as you yourselves know, he proclaims the gospel in boldness and power by the Spirit. But he's speaking to men. Notice here, 
Who is this addressed to? It's declared not to the world, but to who? End of verse 14 and 15. He will declare it to to you. Yeah. That's what I experienced in my testimony. The Spirit spoken to you. Does the Spirit speak to you? Okay, tell me about that. <laughs> has, has he... Um, <laughs> Anyone else? Speaks to his word all the time. Okay. You... A, certain, a certain verse will come to mind when it's very applicable when I need to hear it. Hmm. And it said that here. He's going to be consistent with the word of God. So it speaks to well, right. He speaks. Um, there's wisdom and counsel of others that are. Sometimes other people's words don't help us, certain other people, but wisely chosen is it's very helpful. Anything else? As I considered the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, I could not help but consider the conviction that happens, not just through salvation, but through my Christian life. I think you spoke about that. The, the, the Spirit convicted you about things that needed to change in your life. It seems one of the greatest gifts the Spirit gives to us is when He shows us our sin. He convicts us as believers. We're told this is a lifelong battle, right? In Galatians, between the flesh and the Spirit, the remedy is walking in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not gratify the Desires of the flesh. Wow, that's, that's very, very key, isn't it? Walking is a conscious step-by-step -step activity. Likewise, we must choose to walk in the Spirit. As we do, it keeps us from fulfilling the desires of the flesh. I read some excerpts of a small book. It's about killing the enemy within. It's talking about the flesh by a guy named Lungard. I want to share you a little section out of that book. I've written a, a whole book that describes many ways to fight the flesh, but of all these, they are but preparations for the ultimate work of killing the flesh. They help steady the mind, rein in the affections, and discipline the will, yet they will not destroy the flesh's work unless, that is, they are combined with faith. Faith is the kryptonite. And what was kryptonite? Do you remember what happens to him when he's exposed? To, he becomes like a big blob, right? Whenever he's exposed. Uh, or a wooden stake. The wooden stake refers to a, va a vampire, Dracula. You catch him in his coffin during the day and pound that thing through his chest and it's, it takes him out or a silver bullet, a werewolf. All in one, that's faith. It's our kryptonite, wooden stake, our silver, silver bullet. Faith has to be the only thing that destroys the flesh because salvation comes from the Lord, Jonah 2.9. Faith is to be the only thing that destroys the flesh because the whole work of our salvation is God's from beginning to end. It isn't simply that God accepts us in Christ when we believe, then sends us off to be good little Christians on our own. Our growth in holiness is His work too. Philippians 2.13 The good news of Jesus is not just that we get out of hell free, but that we become like Jesus Himself and are made to live and reign with Him forever in the new heaven and the new earth. And this good news is all by faith from first to last. From beginning to end, through and through, Romans 1.17. Here's how to work your faith. Number one, by faith you will fill your thoughts of the purpose of Christ's death. Jesus died to slay the very lust that entangles you. In fact, it has trapped you precisely because you're no match for it. You may be worn and exhausted from the grief and shame of it, 
ready to throw up your hands and surrender to a life of sin, but there is stored up in Christ plenty of strength to relieve you. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In your deepest distress and anguish, consider the fullness of grace, the riches, the treasures of strength and might and help that are stored up uh, in Him for your help. To work faith in Christ's power over your flesh, your thoughts might run like this, I am poor, I'm a weak creature, I am as unstable as water, I can't conquer my own flesh. My corruption is too much for me and is a step away from ruining me. I don't know what to do. My soul is a desert, a cave full of dragons. I've made promises and broken them many, many times. I'd won. I thought I'd won and would be delivered, but I was deceived. I can tell that if I don't get some help right away, I'll give up on God and make shipwreck of my faith. But here at death's door, I raise up my weak arms. I look to you, Lord Christ, with all grace in your heart, all power in your hand, more than able to slay all my enemies. You make me more than a conqueror. You can only put the misdeeds of the flesh to death by the Spirit, Romans 8.13. And who sends the commands? The Spirit, but Christ. He commands the Spirit to come to us. He sent the Spirit to you. He sent it to you. To you. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Think about the faithfulness of the one who has promised to help you. Christ's help comes as surely as the sun will rise in the morning in its appointed time. But my spirit, says the Lord, in your struggle against sin, never forget your duty but neither forget the power of the Spirit. The killing of the flesh is your duty, but it is His work. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Romans 8.13 By faith we apply all the means of God's grace that He's given to kill the flesh. Humility which makes us small in the middle of a great God. Worship which sin can't survive the conditions of God being feared and revered. Learning to see sin as sin, calling it like it is, owning your sin, no excuse, and you learn to hate it. In loving God, we learn to hate sin. Those things are absolutely congruent. They go together, don't they? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, Proverbs tells us. The Spirit alone convinces your heart of the danger of sin. Without the Spirit's conviction, the flesh will thrive. The Spirit alone supports us when we cry out to God in distress over sin. The Scripture says that the Spirit is the real power of prayer, giving life and vigor and strength in our prayer, and it makes us makes it persuasive to God. When we can't drag ourselves out of bed, He enables us to cry out with groans that cannot be expressed. Romans 8.26. Even we can't speak. He speaks through the Spirit, through us. You will win. You will fight. And you will see your flesh crumble. It is God's pleasure not only to rescue you from hell, but to glorify you with Christ by making you like Him. You will see through your flesh, flesh's most deadly deception. You will turn your eyes away from the most appealing idols. And you will grow in self-discipline and courage. But this is no time to puff out your chest. It's Christ's blood, tenderness, and mercy on you. It is His Spirit's power filling you every step of the way. In every victory, lift your hands to heaven. Give thanks and rejoice with a grateful heart in your Deliverer. He is faithful. Sola Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory.
Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your spirit. You've not left us alone, but you come after us. We know that we're lost in our own sins, in our own ways, and you have um, pursued us, convicted us, brought us to a knowledge of our own guilt and sin, and brought us to a knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ is all in all, that he is Savior and Redeemer, Reconciler. We're thankful that we have bowed our knee to Jesus to trust him. And we pray that you'd help us by your spirit to learn to hate sin more. Help us to daily hate sin, that we would kill it by the strength of faith and your spirit. We thank you for these things that you provide for us to make us look more like Jesus. In his name, amen.